VLEARN is the revolutionary new platform from NOCN Group that enables learning for business, for life. Ideal for this generation of swipers, scrollers and touchscreen aficionados, VLEARN enhances and personalizes every learning experience. Register for a VLEARN demonstration today to be in with a chance to win an iPad and be part of our learning revolution. Since 1878, we forged talents, industrialized skills, and nurtured minds. We all face challenges, but it is how we come together to overcome them that counts. We work with educators, employers, and governments in over a hundred countries to get people into a job, progress in the job, and onto the next job. We are apprenticeships, T-levels, technicals, and traineeships. We are engineering, health and care, and construction. We are aspiration, opportunity, and ambition. We are city and guilds. No one is better qualified. Hi everybody and welcome to the deep dive we've got this afternoon of maintaining and exceeding the quality of endpoint assessment. Uh, first of all, I'd like everyone to introduce themselves. So I'm Sue Shutler from Pearson and I'm joined by Julia Caunt. Hello, I'm Julia Caunt and I'm the Head of Apprenticeships and Academic Progression at the Premier League. Lovely. And Lindsay? Good afternoon, I'm Lindsay Robinson and I'm the Academic Lead for Apprenticeships in the Faculty of Health and Care and Faculty of Allied Health and Wellbeing at the University of Central Lancashire. Thank you. Anthony? Hi, my name's Anthony Preston. I'm a, an Apprenticeship Work-Based Educator in the School of Community Health. I'm midwifery uh, in the Health and Social Care team for the University of Central Lancashire. Um, I forgot what I'm saying. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. And Natasha. Hi, yeah, I'm Natasha Ahmed. I'm a second year um, assistant practitioner and I work in the cardiac cath lab at Blackburn Hospital. Lovely. And Andy. Andy Pollard, senior EPA delivery manager at Pearson. Lovely. So what we want to talk about today is how EPA demand is increasing. And today we want to explore how these, how you as providers and you lovely apprentices have achieved high quality outcomes and are continuing to deal with the capacity to deliver going forward as that capacity grows. So moving on to the first question to discuss is how have you adapted on program delivery in line with the issues created because of the pandemic? Julia, if I start with you. Yeah, no problem, Sue. Well, um, to be honest, we've been very fortunate because our on-the-job training um, has actually continued. So we were able to, to have our players, who are also our apprentices in the clubs, actually actively taking part in training and also in games and competition. So uh, that element of the apprenticeship was able to continue. As with everybody else, the actual learning programme, so the off-the-job, that actually had to switch to remote. So um, that was a steep learning curve for, especially with our apprentices being very practical, very much in the club, very hands-on. So there was quite a steep learning curve there 
for our players. Um, it was quite interesting as well, really, because you see young people all the time on their phones and assume they're really tech savvy. And um, we were really surprised by the fact that they might be able to access YouTube, but they didn't have any idea about the Zoom and the apps that are quite widely used now across education. So it was a bit of an education piece for us there. So in terms of our main adaptations, it was into the, the, the classroom based stuff was actually um, generally done on Zoom, Teams, etc. Um, but our players have adapted really well and we found a, a groove, we found a way of working and actually it's not really delayed us too much. We've still had players work their way to Gateway and through Gateway as well. Excellent, well done. Um, it's good to hear and actually it's really interesting to hear how you say that we make this huge assumption that they're all going to be really tech savvy and then they're not as tech savvy as we think they are and that, you know, that's an interesting um, piece that you've got to have then another set of learning on teaching them to use something like that. So yeah, we might come back to that later. Lindsay, how's it, how's that question been for you? Um, with the apprenticeship provision within health and social care, um, there was a significant challenge obviously to, to um, manage learners experience. So the first thing we did as a university was contact um, our NHS partners, um, direct um, the executive dean of the university contacted um, all our employers direct to assess the landscape but importantly to offer our support as training providers um, with the service that the NHS was was facing and how we could best support our learners um, to remain on, on, on programme where possible and support a breaking learning process if necessary. Um, um, we were very fortunate that our uh, NHS partners were extremely supportive of the apprenticeship provision. They have huge workforce plans and demands in place and they wanted to see the completion of the apprenticeship um, as planned and as timely as possible. So we worked to ensure that our learners' experience remained progressing through the knowledge, skills and behaviours um, but that may be in one area of practice rather be, than being able to rotate out of practice and keeping keeping our learners um, in one area was was um, a key requirement of, of the NHS provision. Um, but similar to Julia, our theoretical provision, our off-the-job learning, moved onto a, an online delivery very quickly and again supported significantly by our university technical services and we provide lots of additional support package uh, to learners, as we say, they're not quite tech, tech savvy, but we've been welcomed to a whole world of teams um, and our, our learners are, are certainly um, embracing that opportunity that teams can provide in addition to face-to-face -to -face opportunities that the university offers. Yeah. Lindsay, out of curiosity, did, did you have to put anybody in a break in learning or were you able to continue to manage with them? Um, we th there was one particular cohort of of our advanced practitioners that that was put on a small break in learning within at the early stage of the pandemic. Mm. Um, we reneg renegotiated the off the job learning around that break in learning, and those learners are, are back on track. But it was only a small proportion because the apprentices still contribute significantly to service given as an, as an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. So they, they were very much valued to, to continue on, on programme. Yeah, um, so Only a small number of learners actually undertook a break in learning um, in the first wave and none in the second wave through the support from both the employer and the university. That's really good to hear. So just thinking about that, where you've had to make adaptions to the learning programme, do you think you'll continue with that approach as we move forward into the future? If I put that back to start with you first, Lindsay. Certainly, the, we, we've we evaluated all um, our, our pandemic um, activities, if you will. We've looked at our recovery activities and looked at what we can take forward into the future. It is a continuing evaluation at the moment as we're still in that phased, almost re planned return based on, on the government's um, path. Um, but there, there are things that we will be taking forward, such as the additional 
um, online, the team support, the support for the learner in the workplace via teams and the role that Anthony does an apprenticeship work-based educator can connect very quickly to the learners um, in supporting their development. So there are, there are certainly um, good practice that we want to take forward um, fr from this experience. Yeah, lovely. And and Julie, you is there anything you will continue to use as you as we move on and progress, and people go more back into everyday life? I think so, definitely. I should also say we did have one club that did furlough apprentices and staff um, for mm. about two and a half, three months. So there was a bit of catch up to be done then. But because of the online learning, because everything is so much more accessible, it actually fitted around the training a lot better. And it was a lot easier for us to pick up players one to one. When I first started dealing with apprenticeships, I wasn't working at the Premier League and it was always very much one to one. Whereas at the moment we're, we've got classes and cohorts. So a lot of the time the players are taught in groups of, sort of 10, 12, even up to 15. But because of the accessibility to players outside of their training regime, it's been really easy to keep them on track and differentiate a lot better. So I think there's certainly... It's certainly an easy and accessible way to, to educate and to meet one-to-one. -one. So I think we'll certainly take that forward. And even in terms of the EPA, we've been doing our endpoint assessment. One of ours is a, a professional interview, and that's been done remotely as part of the flexibilities we've been granted. Um, and we would actually like to see that continue if that's if at all possible. It means easier access for the same reasons to the players. Um, it, it can be conducted in exactly the same way. Um, and also validated and verified as well as authentic. So, uh, so yes, certainly we'll be taking some of that forward. I mean, you can't ever replace the face-to-face. -face. And I think a lot of people are teamed out and Zoomed out and, you know, people are kind of craving for that interaction. And we've been very fortunate that they've had that interaction on the job, but off the job and learning. There's, there is no replacement for just being there face-to-face -face with somebody, but we'll certainly be taking on board some of those lessons learned simply for efficiency as well and that that one-to-one -one ability it's brought so yeah. uh, yes thank you really good so Anthony I mean um, it'd be really good to understand from your perspective because you've had very much of a hands-on role um, having been an apprentice yourself and now obviously being a practitioner and supporting apprentices so thinking about those questions how, how do you feel um, things have changed for you and what adaptions have you had to make and how are any is there anything you've learned that you want to take forward and continue uh, to do yeah um i've learned i've learned a lot from uh, working uh, remotely and and using the accessories to the wonderful world of technology to <laughs> connect with everybody i i was very mobile before all over the northwest of england uh and having that face-to-face -face contact with employees apprentices and mentors is very important um, but how the technology has advanced uh, strangely enough all in time for covid that was uh, uh, really remarkable really how it's all worked and being able to contact everybody um, to have impromptu meetings if need be it's all done very quickly now um, but I, I still envisage going out to see the learners, the apprentices and the employers, but not as often. I think it could be an, a blended approach with um, with uh, electronic um, devices, whether it be your phone or, or, or Teams. What I have learned is you always have to have a backup plan with, with technology and the good old telephone always comes in to save the day. And you can still continue with that, that learning process that goes on in the work-based learning aspect of, of the apprenticeship. Um, so the, the the things that I've learned are to um, manage everything uh, through emails and uh, technology, and uh, hopefully one day we'll, we'll go back to face to face at some point. Um, but yeah, I, I've certainly learned quite a lot of things. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's all been very oh, lovely. Thank you. So Natasha, over to you. Who is who are still an acting apprentice, but also keeping the demands of um, a full-time position. How has this been for you, for your on-programme phase, and how have you managed that with the demands of your day-to-day -to -day job? Um, it's, it's not been too bad. I mean, we've been able to... I've been in my workplace now for about 12 years, so it's been hard to 
because we've not been able to go out and about and learn new things, it's been hard to to get my time in for my work-based learning because I've not been able to really learn something overly new. I'm having to delve down deep and see why I'm doing what I'm doing rather than experiencing completely new things. But it, it's been it's been an experience um, through the pandemic. I mean, it's had its advantages and disadvantages. I've I've quite liked it being online. Um, it works around work a bit better. Um, our mentors, especially Tony, as soon as you need him, you send him a message and he sends you on back straight away. He's been amazing that way. Some others do take a little bit longer to get back to you, so you can hang around and be waiting for him. Um, but yeah, overall, it's been it's been a good experience. And um, the only downfall I'd say is that when you're online um, doing your lessons at home, sometimes people don't turn the cameras on. So it's hard to get a bit more of a rapport like you would do in a classroom setting. So if people were made to turn the cameras on and have a proper group session, it'd be, it'd be a little bit better. But overall, it's been it's been a fine experience for me, really. Yeah. And how far away are you from completion now, Natasha? Um, just a few months, July-ish. Right. So not, not long. <laughs> so you're you're in your preparation, running up to getting ready for Gateway then at yes. this moment. Yeah. And how's that going? It's all right. I'm quite organised. So I've managed to get, with help from people at Tony again, um, it kind of guides you so you know what needs what needs to be in and when. So I've been able to do my SWATs and my PDPs in a timely manner so I'm not rushed at the end. I've been able to get all my certificates in my portfolio and get everything signed off. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's it's just getting everything in order, really, and making sure that you've got plenty of time so you're not overwhelmed at the end. But, yeah, it's it's been it's going good. It's, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And a bit of feedback to uh, everyone who's listening around, uh, turn your cameras on is always really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so thinking about that and moving, talk about Gateway. So, um, Lindsay, how, how do you know that your learners that have been coming through this, um, as you've not been face to face with them and it's been a, a, a remote aspect, how have you known they've been ready to move through into that Gateway period? So as a, as a team, the, the assistant practitioner team are, are very focused on, on learner progression Um as, as you can see, Natasha is very, very happy to, to touch base with Tony on a regular basis and monitoring uh, activity. So it, it's been a constant uh, activity since the start of the apprenticeship in prepping the learners for endpoint, endpoint assessment. Um, we, we build on all activities from the in the 12 week reviews and we, we constantly relate um, any active the activities or the theory activities to the knowledge skills and behaviors and the preparation for uh, endpoint assessment we have been very successful with our endpoint assessment um uh, sorry our success rate for endpoint assessment has, has been very very pleasing uh, for our assistant practitioner program and to me it's a credit to actually what they do in the workplace and have that opportunity to bring that back um, as, as, as a shining star towards at the end of the apprenticeship and, and gives each apprentice the, the chance to really um, um, provide um, evidence of, of all that they've learned over the two years. Um, so we look, we continuously monitor the progression towards endpoint assessment. We have um, our module and academic boards which attach the theory to, to that element of, of the endpoint assessment. But also we look at a 12 month point as well as a, as a, um, a almost like a deep dive progression um, review and whether the learner is, is ready to progress onto year one. Um, so it, it's almost in preparation for endpoint assessment. This is what we're looking at at the end of year one. This is what we need to be achieving at year two. And are you ready to progress with that? And um, our apprenticeship work-based educators have that conversation with um, the learners, with the men mentors and managers. So there's a constant communication and conversation with the employer around the, the progression, but more specifically the readiness for that endpoint assessment. Sorry, Lynn, could I just ask, did you, have you happened to adapt at all because of the pandemic and had to uh, do any extra work or additional steps? Have you had to put them in or, or actually have you not needed to because you're already so organised in how you've been <laughs> delivering it? But, and, but, but 
sorry, because we do monitor that progression, if there's a need for an individual action plan to ensure that that gateway um, is achieved, we can pick that up quite early. So we've not had to put anything or emergency measures in place for learners at a gateway period because we've been constantly monitoring that. Um, we have not extended any um, any of the apprenticeship programmes, but what we what we have done is actively upped our engagement with employers across our apprenticeship provision um, to ensure that that learners can continue um, effectively on on the apprenticeship. Um, our learners are aware of the flexibilities that have been as we said, very much welcomed <laughs> as part of, um, of the um, endpoint assessment process and, and, the, and the fact that our successors have, have suggested that that has been um, welcomed and achievable for the learners. Yeah, lovely. Laura, sorry, Lindsay, quick question. How long have you been delivering standards for now? Since 2017, 18. Wow. Okay, so very different to Julia. So same question to you, Julia, because this is a whole new world for Julia in the world of uh, endpoint assessments, isn't it? So Julia, how, how have you known that your learner's coming this year because she's coming to EPA for the first time, uh, the standards, it's first delivery is now. So how's that been for you? Yes, it's um, it's been a steep learning curve because it is an 18-month to two-year apprenticeship and this is the first time we've been able to put players through through the endpoint assessment and, and only since January as well. So it was obviously only Pearson as our EPAO. So, so yes, it's um, what, the way we approached it. Previously, our players would have done an MBQ, which is very similar to the apprenticeship. So we actually approached it in a similar way. So whereas there's no on-programme assessment that's formal, we set milestones. So we actually, over the every two months, every three months, we were kind of noting where apprentices should be and also doing kind of mock assessments as well. We also continued with what were our MVQ IVs and we turned them into internal quality assurers, so IQAs, and they are still visiting our clubs, albeit at the moment they're doing that remotely, and they're also checking those milestones as well. So, so I suppose informal on-programme assessment is one way. We also have a review every 12 weeks with our players. Um, that's from an education apprenticeship point of view. They also have reviews, multidisciplinary team reviews every six weeks. So they involve the sports scientists, they involve the coaches and also the education teams as well. So the players are constantly checked. We also started doing things like mock assessments, so mimicking what would be the EPA. So we set the knowledge test. Pearson have been very good again in providing some materials for us in our EPA or EPARC, the Endpoint Assessment Activity Resource Pack. <laughs> Snappy title. Um, they, we've been uh, utilising the resources that Pearson have provided, but we've also created some of our own so we can do every sort of three or four months, we stick them in for a little knowledge test, which is one of our endpoint assessment activities. We've also been doing in the reviews, rather than being interviewed by a coach or being interviewed by a member of Premier League staff, we do player-led reviews. So that prepares them really nicely for the interview as well. Um, and in each club, um, so for each cohort in each club, we have the, what we call a CPC, a core programme coordinator, but that's essentially the apprenticeship deliverer, the person that's coordinating that programme. So we keep in touch with them, we've been training them. In fact, again, Pearson are involved at the very early stages of training those, uh, those members of staff. So it's been very much, we've had to keep in touch with them. And again, over the last over a year really it has been remote but that's provided greater accessibility we can just drop an hour in here an hour in there rather than pulling somebody from Newcastle somebody from Southampton into a central location so the efficiency of our training has actually improved but in terms of knowing they're ready for gateway I think the milestones and the reviews are absolutely key and just those mock assessments there's been a massive nervousness around when it got to January everybody's kind of like, who's going to do it first and I think nobody went in until February as soon as one club went through more of the others have started to come through so there will be some um, that have to delay uh, they're not quite ready particularly perhaps where they've been furloughed or where we think they might need extra time um, and for us one of the challenges has perhaps been players that are now at the end of the season and are injured so they can't actually participate in their practice mm -hmm. So, so we've been working closely with Andy at Pearson, Andy Pollard, who's been very good. 
uh, any support in this. We've tried to perhaps look at additional flexibilities for how we can help those players now right at the end of their programme but unfortunately find themselves in this predicament. So, uh, But the flexibilities we, we've actually been granted have been really helpful. So the remote observation, uh, the recorded practical observation has been beneficial because our environments are obviously very secure. We've only been able to continue under the elite sport exemption from the government with the practical element. But in order for that, that's, that's the business. Football is the business. Education is sort of the other side of it and that's not been part of the core business so whereas the staff haven't been furloughed it's still very much been expected to continue they've not been allowed in that environment so it's been very much protected and the very very strict covid protocols so, so yeah some challenges but um i think as i say just to return to the point the, the main things milestones are absolutely key because you can't go for 18 months without knowing where players are how they're progressing yeah, lovely. Thanks, Julia. Anthony, I know we didn't originally think about asking you this question, but from your perspective, the mentor, have you got anything you'd like to add in around making sure that people are ready for Gateway or any changes that have had to happen? Um, so uh, as we've grown with the apprenticeships, uh, my role in, in, encompasses uh, at, the, at the beginning of the course to see what they need to be ready for Gateway. So I'm constantly looking for those things that they need to be having in place for when they get there so over the two years uh if there's anything missing then they have time to pick that up and 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 sort that out ready for gateway also um i think the the endpoint assessment is, is a team effort from pearson's the university the students the employers and the mentors there's a lot of signing to take place there's a lot of writing takes place there's interviews there's there's uh, exams to organize and, and bringing all that together as a team, we, we do that very, very efficiently uh, with, with a good outcome, uh, thankfully. Um, Excellent. Yeah. No, that's great to hear. And do you think that, I mean, I suppose we can, we can come back to it later and when we talk about as the things that we need to do, anything that can be done differently, I think it'd be great. If you've got any ideas there, we can pick that up towards the end about what could be done differently, if at all, to make that process any smoother or slicker it, or just different? If there was one thing I could suggest, it would be less paperwork, I should imagine. <laughs> oh, that's perfect time. Let's hand over to Andy. So, Andy, fr from your perspective, um, what has Pearson done um, to support employers, uh, the providers and apprentices to undertake their EPA during the pandemic, ensuring high quality and consistency have been maintained? Just to echo um, Julia and Linda, it's having that regular engagement, that regular contact with um, employers, with apprentices, with mentors, because if we think right at the very beginning, um, when all the flexibilities sort of came about, there was a lot of change very quickly, very rapidly. Not only did the flexibilities require um, employers and sort of training providers to review their current processes they were going through a state of flux so it was making sure that any information that we were providing was clear it was accessible and we always had the the customer mindset of how can we make this as streamlined as possible while still maintaining the requirements that were set by us by either ifit or the eqa provider so we engaged in quite a few uh, sort of dispensation documents, which narrowed down what will be changing, how apprentices will be assessed. But then we su sort of supplemented that with customer webinars. So we were speaking direct to providers, we were speaking direct to apprentices and to employers to make sure that they were aware of what has changed, what do we need to do to make sure that this apprentice has access to endpoint assessment in a timely manner. Where there were areas where flexibilities needed to be requested, having those conversations. So I'm, I'm very lucky in that I can speak to quite a few providers, understand what are they experiencing at the moment? What is working? What is not working? What do we need to do to make sure that apprentices are not disadvantaged in any way? And using that information and speaking with external quality assurance providers I fit asking for flexibilities, making sure that they're all in agreement 
that the assessment, regardless of COVID, is still safe, fair, valid, reliable, and communicating that. I think one of the key strengths uh, throughout the COVID period is the rate of response. So once we got a flexibility uh, approved, we would then turn around all the documentation in most cases within a week, standardise our independent endpoint assessors because they'd have to be aware of the flexibility and how to make safe, fair, valid assessment decisions, and then communicate that out. From the feedback we've received, all of the feedback, all of the flexibilities have been well received. And in trying to sort of ensure apprentices can progress onto the next stage of their learning or their career. So because there has been quite a few changes, whether it's been a change from a face-to-face -face assessment to remote assessment, having that customer mindset, what can we do to sort of minimise the admin burden? What can we do to try and uh, link two previous documents into one document? to try and make that process a little bit more smoother, streamlined. If we choose the functional skills flexibilities, what, what are the system limitations? What can we do to overcome those limitations to make sure that uh, providers can upload the gateway evidence and the same process of confirming gateway, moving the apprentice into the EPA period. So it's being aware of sort of like a 360 degree view so it's not just from Pearson as an endpoint assessment organisation, but it's from a provider perspective, from an employer perspective, making sure that all, all of us are on this journey together. Because we have got the ultimate aim of making sure that apprentices achieve and making sure that whatever we do works for every provider. Lovely, thank you. And that leads, leads nicely back to um, Lindsay and um, Julia. Do you, do you feel that you've been supported through this process um, and that you've had all the information in a, a clear and timely manner? Or as, do you feel that anything was lacking? Lindsay, do you want to go first? Oh, I, I'd, I want to thank um, Andy and team, um, certainly for, for the, the communications around the, the endpoint assessment process, the flexibilities. Um, it was good open communication that, that uh, ourselves as a provider recognised the barriers that Pearsons were, were facing in waiting for judgments and decisions about what extent those flexibilities um, could be applied. Um, but we have very strong communications with, with Pearsons that it has enabled us to, to support that cascading of information to the learners and employers. So thank you. Thank you. Julia? Yeah, I uh, agree completely with Lindsay. And right, right from the start, and we had to interpret the standard. I was on the Trailblazer group that wrote the standard, along with my colleagues that, that work with the EFL. Um, but obviously, getting a standard in practice, you suddenly realise there's, there's potentially some issues. So we've had to go back to IFAT and Ofqual with some things just to ensure the smooth running of the apprenticeship. So um, Pearson, uh, Sue yourself, Andy as well, have been key to that. So we, we very, very much value your support. But even at the start, um, Sue, you were involved in the training of our, of our key staff that work out in the clubs with the apprenticeship delivery. It was all very new to us and a whole new way of working. So that was key. Lots of new terminology and acronyms to pick up. Uh, and even, even down to today, I mean, we're still dealing with Andy today. We've got little scenarios that occur. We've got a player waiting to go through get gateway. I always say player, but it is obviously apprentice. We've got an apprentice waiting to go through gateway. But there's a typo on one of his certificates that needs to be uploaded to ACE 360. So he's been waiting. His, his name's spelled incorrectly. So we couldn't use that to claim his overall apprenticeship. But we've worked with Andy and there's a way around just getting that player through Gateway while we're awaiting the reprint. As long as we can prove that that player's got his, his functional skills, then there's no problem. But also down to, you know, we, we have, and I'm sure other people do, apprentices that move employer we've got players that move between clubs and now is the time of the year when players are giving their decisions about whether they get professional contracts and some players pick up other clubs so they prepared to do their endpoint assessment at one with one employer and are now with another employer so again we come to Pearson we ask advice and we found you know you've been very very responsive very very supportive 
and you've helped us iron out the, those difficulties. But even from the start, obviously, we, we've all had to work together. ACE 360 was a whole new system. There's been things we've had to work with, with them on to make sure it's fluid. Not one, one issue we came across was the knowledge test appears to be booked through ACE 360, but it's actually not. It's booked through Edexcel online. So again, it's, it's all about communication. And we found the open lines and open channels of communication with Pearson have been very, very good. We can resolve things very, very quickly, get that message straight out to our employers or clubs. And things have been actually <laughs> really smooth. So uh, fingers crossed for, I know our achievement rates will be affected because we've got some injured players and because for whatever reason, some players might not actually get their functional skills. But generally speaking, it's been a very positive experience of the apprenticeship. And uh, and for the apprentices on there, I think they'd agree it's, it's a positive experience because what it's enabled them to do as players is take more responsibility for their own learning. Whereas we might have had, for example, in performance analysis, a player working with an analyst that does all their video clips for them. Whereas now the apprentice is actually at the centre of that. They need to do all their own clips and learn about their own development. So it's actually been a really, really positive experience of the apprenticeship. Um, and again, the resources from Pearson to support that have been, have been really good. Oh, lovely. Thank you. It's really good to hear from both of you. Thank you very much. So question back to Anthony and Natasha now. So from a learner perspective, and I appreciate Anthony, I'm, I'm asking you this as you're so closely connected to those learners in their everyday jobs. Um, how did you feel that during these unprecedented times, you know, did you feel reassured that, that the process was correct and that everything was happening um, was, was in the right order on top of everything that was going on with your day job? And Anthony and Natasha, I don't mind who answers first. Yeah, well, when it all first came about, I didn't really know what was happening at first. I was a bit worried that everything was going to come to a halt and that I'd have to um, put everything on hold for now. So that scared me a little bit. But then I got reassured by work and by everybody else that it was it was going to carry on. Um, so it was obviously a new way of working. But like I mentioned, it, it, it's been all been a positive experience. Um, everyone's been really supportive. Everything's been done in a timely manner. Um my manager she's been really good whenever I've needed time out um to go and do university work she's she's allowed me every now and then we've had to switch work-based learning days and work days so we can, I can come and help at work but that's not ever been a problem everything's just been really smooth I've not had any issues at all really um yeah everyone's just been there to hand and everyone's been brilliant excellent it's good to know that I think one of the, the issues and concerns with people might have is that your day job would, would consume completely everything to do with your work-based learning. But it's lovely to hear that you've yeah. had that lovely flexibility from your manager to allow you to still do everything yeah. you need to do to complete your course. It's been nice because you can, since COVID's come in, obviously it's a completely new thing to everybody. So for our work-based learning, we've been able to include Every, all the changes that have occurred with all your PPE and everything. So it's, even though it's been a big, big thing that's happened, it's contributed towards our portfolios and towards our experience. So in a way, it's been a, it's been a positive experience. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. And Anthony, from your perspective, how yeah. do you feel it's gone? I, I think it's gone quite well, actually. And when we have had uh, a few issues where... Um, Apprentices have been moved because theatres have shut or something, but they've had to go into uh, an acute setting. Uh, they've been able to have transferable skills from the theatres uh, and they've been able to put those into place. And we've had been able to have discussions with the managers and mentors and the learners so they didn't have to take a break in learning and, and they were able to go about their apprenticeship and manage to achieve uh, really good outcomes from that. So and it's been a really bad experience that everybody's had, but there has been some positive outcomes with regards to apprenticeships um, with what they've been able to learn from that experience. Uh, it's been invaluable, I think, uh, especially around uh, Public Health England uh, responses and uh, PPE and infection control and, and, and just generally how it's affected the whole uh, health service and uh, care service and, and all the other areas attached to what the learners are involved with. So, so if, if there was one one takeaway point from all of this that you could say to other people that's you know been the standout point what would that be 
it would be to re remember you're an apprentice and you can gain a learning experience from more or less any environment that you're thrown into uh, because you are literally put into an environment that you've never been into but you could you could work it in your in best interest through positive positive working as an apprentice and learning new skills that are transferable into your own job as well so mm. Oh, brilliant. And Natasha, is the one thing that you would take away? So if you were to talk to a group of people who are considering taking on an apprenticeship, what's the one thing and the takeaway point that you would say to them from your experience of going through this? Um, it's an odd one, is that? I'd, I'd, definitely, I'd definitely say do it. It's, a, it's definitely an experience. Um, <coughs> it has been difficult, but once... If you're organised and once you get into the flow of things and if you've got all these people, there's so many people that are there to support you. Um, it's nothing to be scared of. I think I think people would enjoy you doing it. And then, um, I don't know what to say. Um, there's just plenty of people that are there to support you and I think it's it's a good move. It's good for your career. Um, yeah, it's you're working on the job. So you're, like Tony said, you're always learning something new. It's It's good and it's apprenticeship isn't it so you, you're getting paid while you're doing while you're doing your training while you're doing something that you love so yeah I'd say go for it. Excellent thank you. So looking at the uh, quantity of EPAs and thinking about that part of this deep dive questions Andy considering the level of demand in EPA how can we ensure that there is sufficient capacity in the system for you to continue to deliver assessments as you're required to? That's the million dollar question, Sue. In terms of balancing the amount of apprentices that need endpoint assessment and the availability of independent endpoint assessors. So throughout the COVID period, I think the the number of apprentices sort of nationally who required endpoint assessment did dip because of furlough, because of uh, delays with gateway evidence. But very quickly, once the flexibilities were introduced and the the sort of the overcoming of waiting for certificates to be printed, the um, digital signatures that we could accept for gateway evidence, we did start to see an uptick. And back to the sort of before Christmas time, we were back up to projected levels of endpoint assessment. Look like. Independent endpoint assessors were still with us throughout all of this time. So we were able to sort of continue with that level of service to make sure that apprentices were assessed in a timely manner. We're working more and more in sort of strategic partnerships. So by having the strategic partnerships, talking with occupational experts or industry experts who will be uh, requiring apprentices to undertake endpoint assessment, setting up sort of hubs. So if one employer has one apprentice that requires uh, an endpoint assessment, can we match um, that employer, take them through the independent endpoint assessor training to assess the other employer with the one apprentice? And I think that's the way to go because looking at all of the assessment plans and quite rightly so, Independent endpoint assessors have to be occupational experts. They have to be working in the field. They have to maintain their um, uh, CPD to make sure that those decisions are safe, uh, valid and reliable. So more and more sort of partnership conversations, exploring who within an organisation would meet the assessment plan requirements for an independent endpoint assessor and then developing them in the assessor role. So some assessment plans require assessors to hold an A1 or a tackle qualification, others don't. So it's looking at each standard individually and tailoring the actual assessor requirements. And we can only start doing that through more and more partnerships. Do you want to just quickly expand on that slightly? So looking at the partnerships, can you just describe, um, you know, I appreciate you might not want to name them, but how, how is one of those partnerships worked in practice and how is that benefiting you as an EPAO? So one of the partnerships that we're working with currently, the partners are actually part of the qualification development process. So they are working 
on the specification, the Endpoint Assessment Resource Pack. And what they're doing is they're bringing their occupational sort of expertise and matching it with our assessment expertise. And from that, we can make sure that the assessments that we're creating and uh, going to be delivering once apprentices enter the EPA period are robust, fit for purpose, and truly ref reflect what the sector needs. Excellent, thank you. It's good to hear. So, um, Joy and Lindsay, just think about everything we've been through and everything we've talked about. Do you see, or are you anticipating, an increase in demand um, as a result of either the pandemic, or do you just generally see that there'll be an increase of demand um, because of the experiences um, that you've seen from, I think, I think so, sorry, let me split the question into two. So, Lindsay, from your perspective, do you think there will be an increase in demand as a result of the pandemic into the areas that you offer standards in? I think the, the, the pandemic has, has um, accelerated the decision uh, for a, um, an increase, <laughs> increased nurse, nursing workforce, uh, very much uh, a national driver to, to look at all our health and social care professional programmes uh, and support workforce. The organisations are very... Um, very keen to support the grow your own model. Um, certainly, the uh, in partners that are, that I'm involved with uh, absolutely embrace the grow your own model and have the opportunities of their employers from from a, a, a level two, level three, right up to level seven apprenticeship, and and how we can support um, progression through each of those apprenticeship standards. Um, that's that's very valuable um, in the health and social care workplace, mm -hmm. and because that opportunity is there for employers um, and learners to to be part of that grow your own model, that I feel there will be um, an increase um, in apprenticeship um, requirements, and also um, the, the high profile that the, the healthcare systems have been <laughs> been mm -hmm. under the spotlight certainly over the last. Um, year um, will, will influence the numbers of apprentices um, that are coming forward. And we welcome that opportunity, as Natasha says, to be able to, 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 learn, in the work, to learn in the workplace, be, be part of that service provision. Um, but certainly important for, for us, it's about um, being able to extend care for patients, care for service users, uh, and having... Uh, the opportunity or the apprentices expose you to that um, real, real world, real life experience mm. while gaining uh, a qualification. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it'd be interesting, won't it? Julia, for you, because your apprenticeship is so new and this is the first time anyone has been through it, I think I'll tweak the question slightly, say, do you think from the positive experiences that the learners have had, do you think that will encourage, they'll, be a, a, a voice to encourage other learners to take this on and then therefore would you think you might see an increase in demand for people wanting to do the apprenticeship? It, it is a good question and I mean just to give some context really um, when players get to under 16 finish their GCSEs they can be offered a scholarship and players that are offered a scholarship so only under 17 under 18 age brackets they will have the opportunity to do an apprenticeship at the moment, I'd say about 80% of our scholars do the apprenticeship. Some don't because it's not accessible to them. They might not be able to pass the functional skills. They might come from another country. Uh, English might not be their first language. So there might be other barriers in doing the apprenticeship. So we don't foresee it changing in the sense of recruitment because we don't actually actively recruit the individuals. They're recruited by the clubs and then... Uh, we assess them for their appropriateness on the apprenticeship. So they get a choice as to whether they want to do it or not. Um, probably more so from our point of view with Brexit, we won't now be bringing in players from European countries. So that will affect the recruitment of players and obviously affect numbers. So we've yet to see, because this will be the first season we've not been able to recruit from European countries, whether the number of scholars will be different or whether clubs will, will simply source players from 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 England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. So, so that would be um, the difference in terms of numbers. I don't think um, 
in terms of the, the volume of players we actually get on the apprenticeship. We don't foresee it unless that factor is an issue. We don't foresee it particularly changing. So, so yeah, I think the answer would be, at the moment, we're assuming to be consistent, but it wouldn't necessarily have anything to do, I don't think, with the pandemic. Um, it might be a barrier. Some employers might consider it a, a barrier some of the clubs, the fact that we've not been able to get those uh, injured players through because mm. we've got players at the start of the programme that are being rehabilitated, then it might be a problem to get them on the apprenticeship. So we might not even put them on in the first place because they're injured and we don't know how long that injury might, might take to, to kind of heal. So there's a few factors for us to consider, but I don't think the pandemic will affect our numbers um, noticeably. No, okay, lovely. Um, another question, you know, and it's a strange question, I suppose, but do you anticipate there being a rush to the finish line for apprentices who need to complete as the restric restrictions are lifted? So those learners are not necessarily taking a break in learning, but um, through demands of their day job may have taken a step back and have not gone through gateway as you've been anticipated at the times they would and are, are now going to go through so if I come to you first, Lindsay, with that question. Um, from our own university perspective, we, we've, as I said earlier, we've been able to manage this process um, and we've not got that huge rush to the, to the finish line with, with cohorts of learners across the apprenticeship provision. But I do suspect nationally um, where learners have because we know that there's been a whole range of ex, 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 <laughs> exceptional circumstances where learners have had um, um, breaks in learning or, or even the defers, you know, for four, a four week period. Um, so I do think there will be a rush across a whole range of apprenticeships. Um, just for something for pieces to perhaps brace brace themselves. Yeah, at. that question is going to Andy next to see how yeah. he's going to cope with that. <laughs> um, but I think um, I think the picture is that where it's been possible, uh, all employers and training providers have managed that where they can in the best interests of the learner. Um, so rather than halt the whole apprenticeship provision consistently from from the first lockdown I think there's been a staggered approach and and that's what, what may come come your way Sue and Andy <laughs> yeah that, that's Andy. just my, my opinion of, of the national picture I would suggest yeah absolutely Andy how do you feel um from your perspective that do you think there'll be a, a rush because obviously you can see data of of what's happening what do you feel is going to happen there yeah, so we have seen um, an uptick in the amount of apprentices and uh, apprentices reaching gateway very, uh, very fast. So again, going back to the independent endpoint assessor availability, it is looking at, yes, there are independent endpoint assessors out in the sector, but what are the different ways we can attract new independent endpoint assessors? So partnerships is one um, aspect that we can explore. Second is looking at employers. Mm -hmm. So who have we got in within employer settings? Do they meet the assessment plan requirements? What additional training could be offered to uh, cover the, the A1 Assessor Award, TACRA Award? What can we do to support those employers? Because ultimately, yes, we need independent employment assessors to assess apprentices, but also thinking about the on programme and the sort of teaching, learning, assessment and mentoring of apprentices on uh, the on-programme piece. Employers, uh, they're there. Mm. They will be with that apprentice day in, day out. They can support that apprentice. They can develop the apprentice. And it's going back to the, the tri-party agreement that within the apprentice's uh, learning journey, there is the employer, there is the provider and the mentor. And it's all working together to make sure that that apprentice has the knowledge, skills and behaviours to achieve a positive EPA outcome at the end of it. Can I ask another follow-up question, Andy? How do you ensure that you remain a consistently, obviously this is all about um, quantity, but also quality of EPA. So how, how can you, from that assessor perspective, when you've got assessors coming from who different places who, as you said, in 
have occupational competence and therefore are, are in a day job or working for others. How do you ensure that that quality meets the standards that you would expect as an EPAO? So it's all to do with quality assurance and using quality assurance in different ways. So it's not only looking at the assessment decisions, but also looking at the behaviours of the assessor. So accompanied visits, seeking feedback from apprentices, building up a picture of the independent endpoint assessor and making sure that they are aligned to Pearson's values, giving regular uh, feedback, CPD actions, providing developmental opportunities. That's the only way we can measure how effective an independent endpoint assessor is because ultimately we have the quality assurance mechanisms in place. But from an EQA provider and from an IFA uh, perspective, Pearson are accountable for every grade that is awarded. So we have to put in place varying different measures to make sure that the, the grade the apprentice receives is accurate, is correct, and is assessed in line with the assessment board. Brilliant, thank you. Anthony, quick question for you. Obviously, considering the fact that you have been an apprentice yourself, albeit in um, not in a new, not going through the standards as we have them today. Yeah. Um, do you see any um, significant benefits of the new apprenticeship standards in comparison to the apprenticeship that you went through? Can you see those? Because obviously, part of the rationale was about making it higher quantity, higher quality. Uh, more relevant. Can you can you see that having been through it yourself and now obviously on the other end of being a mentor and delivering? Yeah, um, the the standards that I was working to were very specific, whereas the apprenticeship standard skills uh, are, are more uh, flexible and you're able to um, it, it's flexible to any of the disciplines that I work with, if if you will. Whereas the the, the standards I worked to, they were more specific to one role. Um, but now I, I see them, they, they will fit into uh, a lot of the arenas that I'm working with, which is which is really good. So that there's a common ground for everybody to to see that it is achievable to get to uh, the level of competency that, that is required of the standards. Um, so um, I think it's beneficial for all, really, having these new standards. Oh, good. Good to hear. And Natasha, coming to you, obviously you're getting to the end of your apprenticeship. So what are the next steps for you um, and how's your apprenticeship going to support you to do that? I wrote some down about this. Just hold on a sec. Um, so I've just wrote here that my next step is to use my skills and knowledge to commence my work as a band four. I've put this apprenticeship will support me because it has given me research based knowledge to practice to the best of my ability in a safe and personal effective manner. It has allowed me to discover why I do what I do rather than just doing it. Um, I definitely consider mentoring others and sharing my knowledge I have learnt throughout the course. Um, I believe sharing my knowledge from the perspective of fellow apprenticeship helps others to relate easier knowing um knowing that i've experienced what they're currently um experiencing themselves so yeah it's good to hear and and lindsay and julia from from your perspective the apprentices that you know you've got going through at the moment um what are their next steps what's the general i mean it'd be interesting for your for your learners julia to see what their next steps will be um, we all know what they want to do, um, but it'd be interesting to see. So what do you think it will be, mean, what, what do you think this apprenticeship means to them? Um, as, I, as I said earlier in answer to one of your other questions, I think it's really focused the attention of the player being at the centre of the whole process. Whereas, you know, in some ways you can do things parrot fashion, can't you? If, you, mm. if you're not checked and challenged. And I think, you know, the apprenticeship has really focus that in the apprentice's mind and giving them more ownership over their learning you know they will develop those skills those technical tactical skills physical fitness but um, I think now having them involved in the other processes also outlines to them perhaps other avenues after football as we always say football is not a lifelong career if you're lucky you'll you'll finish and retire in your early 30s so they have to consider other things and through the apprenticeship they will learn about performance analysis they'll learn about sports science they'll learn about nutrition psychology 
you know, to some extent medicine through the physiotherapy. So there's, there's lots that they can do and consider what they might like to do. And part of the apprenticeship again plans for their second career, what's going to happen next. So we very much believe in helping and supporting players. And sort of around the periphery of that, we have a very detailed player care programme, which involves quite a lot of life skills. So, you know, but the good news is from the point of view of the apprenticeship, about 80% of our players actually do progress onto the next stage of their journey into a professional contract. So at that point, the progression is very, very good. The rest of the players, some might go abroad and um, take on a US scholarship, so they'll continue their learning at university or college and also continue to play football. Some will continue to trial and try to find other clubs, but then others will return to education or perhaps further employment and training. So, so our plan through the apprenticeship and through the whole scholarship programme and, and how we support our players is to give them those tools um, to support them and enable them to, to move on whenever football does end. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, on a positive note, the apprenticeship has, has been a good thing. The MBQ for us was always a good thing. But I think the apprenticeship has taken it now to that next level and gives our players a good opportunity and grounding to move on into their you know, transition into the next stage of their journey. Thank you. And, and Lindsay, how have you found it? Because obviously you offer multiple apprenticeships. So how, how do you feel? What are the next steps for your apprentices? Do you see them moving on to another apprenticeship or moving on and giving them a new insight into a new career? Well, I think just, just reflecting what um, Natasha said there, there's obviously two years of learning knowledge, skills and behaviours that, that as an employer and, and support supporting of employers that they want, they would like to see that embedded in practice in the, in the assistant practitioner role in particular. And what service look for is the impact and the evaluation of that role in order to 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 provide that opportunity for others. We know if assistant practitioners work well and, and that there's a positive impact on the service, we're going to continue on that apprenticeship journey for many more um, assistant practitioners. But you're right, we, we do offer a range of um, programmes from, as I say, from level three to level seven. And what we've done is we've um, mapped both the assistant practitioner and the nursing associate uh, apprenticeships into the registered nurse um, pathways to for an accelerated entry into registered nurse. Um, but again, having that um, academic award, but also achieving that apprenticeship opens many, many more doorways. Um, so just wish uh, Natasha all the success as well on, on having those decisions to make moving forward. Oh, um, I'm you. sure she's very valued in the team on, on the cath lab. Um, yeah, I like where I work. So I think I, I do want to stay here and support my colleagues because I've been here such a long time. And just to move up in my band and do more things and be trusted more and help them out, it's, um, yeah, it's nice. It's nice to be able to do it. I'm enjoying um, it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I'd just like to say thank you know, thank you to everyone for joining today. It's been really interesting to hear all of the views and see how you've ma managed and coped. And yes, echoing Lindsay there, good luck, Natasha. Oh, Wish thank you, you all the very best in thank your you. future and your career. That's been wonderful. And um, yeah, thank you for joining today. Has anyone got anything else you'd just like to add at the end? Silence. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> well, over to you then. Thanks, Natasha. Thank and you. Anthony, Julia, Lindsay and Andy, thank you very much for joining today. And, and that was a really interesting discussion into um, the benefits of EPA and the quality of the delivery going forward. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.